Kentucky, I think. You say, why? Because Jeremiah's sick and he's making me go. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Daniel, in the Bible, Daniel, we were in the book of Daniel. We've been out now a little bit. Somebody else teaching a class and may probably teaching something else. We were in Daniel chapter 5, and Daniel chapter 5 is all about the handwriting on the wall, and uh, we sing about it, we have songs about it, and uh, there's a practical teaching across the board in Daniel 5, and you know, we always look at it three ways as we say, and you'll hear me say this quite a bit, and you say, why do you repeat yourself? Here's why. The way people learn is through repetition. Did you ever learn a song? Some of you singers in here. You didn't get it the first time you heard it. Now, if you're a musician, that's a little different because the chord progressions always repeat themselves. And if you're familiar with the fourths and the fifths and all that other stuff, you know, most chord arrangements. So that's repetitious. And if you hear a tune, a good musician, that's why these musicians are able to get up here and hear that chord change. And they know exactly when that seventh is hit, they're going to the next chord, so on and so forth. But learning the words to a new song you have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it unless you wrote it. And if you wrote it, you probably sweat drops of blood over it. So it's pretty well ingrained in your mind. And that's how you learn anything. If you want to learn how to draw cartoons, I started drawing Fred Flintstone out of the funny paper when I was just, just little. I can still draw Fred Flintstone today. I'm not going to show you, but I always like that. But I didn't just wake up one day and be able to do that. I had to do it over and over and over and over. Same with learning an instrument. Man, when you first start. Now, me and Brother Tom go way back. I'd come over to his house, and he'd take me upstairs to his room, and I'd go up the steps, turn right. We were in that room. And he had a guitar, and he had an old beat-up something he called a guitar that he gave me. And he would be picking something and just a play and he'd tell me, now you do this, do, 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 or something. Or I was strumming and he, I like to never learn that, but I'd leave there and go home and practice that for the next time I saw him, I might have it. But he'd be on something else. And I couldn't learn. <laughs> yeah. Picking another song. It just, what I'm saying is repetition is how you learn. So you're going to hear the pastor say a lot of things over and over again, especially when it's practical ways to study or to understand the Word of God. So you're going to hear me say it. We're going to look at the Scriptures three ways. You've heard me say it a hundred times. We're going to look at the historical setting of the Scriptures. We're going to look at the doctrinal reference of the Scriptures. And then we're going to look at the spiritual ramification of the Scriptures. So you don't want to be spiritualizing everything in the Bible because you never knew where you stand on any doctrine. Doctrine is fundamental, dogmatic. This is how it is. And some doctrine in the Bible doesn't apply just to you and I. So Old Testament, which was written to the Jew and to at that time, the doctrine for ramifications were uh, to those people at that time. So to us, it's a spiritual application. And you'll find the Apostle Paul quoting a lot of Old Testament scriptures and bringing some of those things in into the New Testament and applying them to the doctors that, doctrines that he taught and showing you. So that's how we look at the Bible. So we've looked at it uh, historically, when it was written, who it was written to. We've looked at it doctrinally, how does it fit? And we know that the doctrinal ramifications of Daniel chapter 5, they're handwriting on the wall. <clears throat> you say, well, I don't have anything to do with the church. Doctrinally, no, it doesn't. But in the aspect of the nation of Israel, it does. Not only was the handwriting on the wall for the king Belshazzar of that day when God's hand come down there, but it was for the nation of Israel. Because that word got out. Daniel was one of the prophets or a prophet of that time, lived in the kingdom uh, as a, as a uh, prisoner, if you please. But he had pretty much full reign there and that was for the nation of Israel the handwriting on the wall as well as it was for Belshazzar now so you say well what does it have to do with the church doctrinally it doesn't have anything to do with the church historically it doesn't have anything to do with the church but spiritually it has something to do with the church you say well how do you mean well spiritually the principle of God writing on the wall to show them what was going to happen that night and to show Israel that God hey Israel's days are numbered and they've been wanting and they're going to be judged. That's all was significant to the nation of Israel. See, how does it apply to the church? Well, we get the spiritual application. Look, and that's why we sing the songs, the handwriting on the wall. 
can't you see the handwriting on the wall? You say, how's that apply? Well, you might say, because of sin. If you sin and you sin and you sin, you're going to pay for sin. Say, what is that? That's the handwriting on the wall. You see the spiritual application? Where did we get that thought? We got it out of a, doc a doctrinal ramification out of the book of Daniel. And if we right rightly divide the word of God, we're not saying that is the church. We're just saying there's a good spiritual application to that thing in reaping what you sow. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Well, that verse wasn't around when God wrote on the wall. But it applied because the principles of God are sure all the way down through the ages. When you study God and theology, when you study theology as the, the teaching of God, uh, you find out that God is a God of principles and those principles never change. Simple principles. He's righteous. He's holy. That has never changed. He's immutable. That has never changed. And then that trickles right on down to other principles. You reap what you sow. The handwriting on the wall. So once you know some of those things, you're able to put them together. And so all Scripture is given by inspiration of God for reproof, for correction, for doctrine. So we can learn something out of anything we study. And here, uh, Daniel chapter 5 <clears throat> speaks to the Jew, speaks to Belshazzar, the Gentile power of the time. And it looks forward to you and I as, look, try to live right with God. And if you don't, this Bible's full of the handwriting on the wall. So uh, that's the implication. So let me read those last few verses in um, Daniel chapter 5. I'm looking around here. I had a question on this. Uh, I had the question two Sundays ago, and I generally try to field the questions. Uh, I think the question was, do you believe that Babylon, because that's where we're at here in Babylon, and uh, do you believe that Babylon is a literal physical place, and do you believe it'll be a literal physical place during the tribulation period? And uh, I, my answer, well, number one, I want to know, I understand the question, but what caused you to ask that? And they said, well, I've read where uh, New York City is, is Babylon. I said, okay. I said, I've read that too, and I disagree with that. And they want to know, well, why? And it looks good to me. I said, well, it doesn't look good through the lens of the Word of God. So we gotta, we got to judge everything by the Word of God and what the Word of God is saying. Now, Babylon is in the book of Revelations, chapter 17, is talked about. And you've got two types of Babylon in a nutshell. I didn't want to really teach on this, but let me just try to answer that question. There's uh, the mother of harlots, which is connected to Mystery Babylon in the first chapter 16 and a little earlier. And it, we know that it's talking about a system of, of pagan religion because the woman's connected with it. And all the way through the book of Proverbs, she's recognized as uh, the harlot is recognized as spiritual fornication or, or bowing to other gods other than the God. And it's looked at as a spiritual fornication. Uh, and it, that, that's one of the precepts of God all the way through. If you're not bound to the Lord God, then you're, uh, you're fornicating spiritually against God, which is definitely a mess. Then in chapter 17 of Revelation, you have uh, Babylon the Great, and that's called the city. One's called the woman, and one's called the city. Now, if you get the two confused, you're going to have problems trying to understand, is it a real place? Is it one place? No. One's considered a woman or that mystery Babylon, and she's destroyed in the first three and a half years because she's a religious system, and when the Antichrist gets on the scene, he's not going to go with any other religion. He's going to ride that religion as you saw uh, the woman on the beast with the seven heads. Remember the heads we talked about and the vision he saw? And that woman is destroyed. You say, well, what takes over? I'll tell you what takes over. Antichrist takes over and every, the whole world has to bow to him because he's claiming to be God and he needs a city just like the Lord has Zion. 
uh, the Antichrist will have a city. You say, well, Babylon's no more. It's nothing more than a village now. And they took all the stones and all the rocks and everything and built other villages and things in that area around about it. You're right. That's a pretty desolate area. And 20 years ago, it was really desolate. But in 20 years, you've seen the rise of Saddam Hussein, who tried to rebuild and said he was the next Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, there's a lot went on. And so I'm still to the opinion uh, that there will be another city of Babylon and that it will be destroyed in the last three and a half years because of the book of Revelation chapter 13. Now, that might have, people say, well, why don't you believe New York City is Babylon, uh, Mystery Babylon? I, well, I can't find it in the Word of God. Why not Chicago? Why not San Francisco? You know, why not Paris? Why, why not Rome? Uh, it just, it, it starts... You know, that thing will snowball. Anybody can write anything, but if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, I'm going to stick with the Word of God. Amen? So that's what we do. So uh, that was one of the questions that was asked about our study. And uh, here Belshazzar uh, is in the Babylonian king kingdom, and he's falling. He's going to fall. And the handwriting on the wall, we were right over there about verse 17. And Daniel answered and said, before the king, let thy gifts be to thyself. Daniel didn't want anything the king had to offer him for coming in and reading the handwriting on the wall. Uh, he says, and give thy rewards to another, yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Uh, he says, O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him whom he would he slew and whom he would he kept alive and whom he would he set up and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beast and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen. He's giving you a, an overview and it, it ends in verse 31. There's only about 14 verses here. Verse 22 and thou and though his son and Thou his son, old Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart. Uh, note that one of his biggest problems, he would not humble his heart. Uh, thou knewest uh, all things, though thou knowest all things, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of this house before thee, and, and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and brass, iron, wood, stone, uh, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose all are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Now, because that's that spiritual fornication, he is went out on God. He has gone, and although he knew better, because his father Nebuchadnezzar, he knew better because Daniel had told him, and he, if you please, excuse the pun, seen the handwriting on the wall. Now you would have thought that Belshazzar, his son, would have seen what Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had seen and would have not had to go there. But he didn't pay heed to it. He would not listen to it. And the Bible says he had all the wisdom and everything. So a person can know a whole lot about God and still decide to go out there and serve the God of gold, silver. And there's a, this is a polytheistic type thing here. It's all idolatry. But uh, the God of gold, the God of silver, that's different gods. And when you do that and don't go after God, then you are a spiritual fornicator committing spiritual adultery against God who put the breath in your nostrils. That's, that's what's going on here. Sad to say, that's the historical setting. That's, uh, uh, and the Jew is in captivity because they did the very same thing. That's why they ended up in captivity there. They started chasing after the gods of the world and the gods of the heathen idolaters on the land. And God said, well, look, if you're going to go out on me, now that's a modern day term, have an affair with somebody else, 
And God is a spirit and must be worshipped in spirit and truth. So you're out here spiritually doing something else, but you're not spiritually holding me up as God. You're like an adulterer, and that's the picture all the way through the Word of God. That's how God has chosen to reveal it to you because we understand that. So if people get together, a man and a wife get together, they meet each other, they fall in love, and uh, this is Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, he talks about the husband and the man. And that's the analogy, the subject lesson God gives us. And they're supposed to live together in harmony, live together in love, live together and raise their family. They're supposed to be fruitful and all, so on and so forth. We know all about that. That's just the precepts of God, how God laid the situation out. But if that man chooses to go out on that woman, how long do you think that relationship's going to last? And she finds out about it. Well, what if he's uh, the guy that, uh, you know, he's head over heels in love. He's never going to do anything wrong. He's always going to love and cherish her. And she decides to go out on him. And he finds out about it. Uh, would you say that that relationship is rocky at best? Would you say they're probably looking maybe to separate and go their separate ways? Say why? Because somebody went out on somebody. Amen. That's the subject lesson God gives you to teach you about spiritual fornication and spiritual adultery. When we chase the gods of this world and we don't chase, David said, my heart panteth after thee as the heart panteth after the water brooks. We're supposed to pant after God like he is our glory, he is our praise. Of Song of Solomon, he is our lover. He is our caretaker. And so often we take God for granted, put him over here and fall in love with something over here. And you say, well, but I say I'm good. I say I love God. Look, have you heard the old cliche, actions speak louder than words? Amen. <laughs> and so if you're on the lake every Sunday in that $30,000 Ranger bass boat, oh, come on, we wouldn't do that, would we? No. You say there's Christians that do that? Yeah, that's a man thing, but women might have the same problem. I mean, we got to take a little time out of our, if we really love the Lord, and pant after God like the heart panteth after the water brook. If we're not careful, we're, we're into spiritual trouble with God, and we're committing spiritual fornication. And if not exactly that, we're at least flirting with it. You follow what I'm saying? So that's the teaching here. Now watch. And he gets ready, but uh, hast lifted up thyself against the Lord. I'm in verse 23. I read that. Look at verse 24. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, that's God, and this writing was written. God chose to do a lot of things by the written word. That's why the written word is very important today. You know that the hand of God wrote that Bible. People can't figure it out. They, oh, man wrote that. Thing. Listen, the scripture as we know it was inspired of God, written by man, but as the age of the old men were moved by the Holy Ghost of God to write what they wrote. And I don't know that they understood everything that they wrote. I don't understand some of the stuff they wrote. You say, why? Because it's a holy book and it's a perpetual book and it continues to speak to us. So Anytime God writes anything down, we probably ought to pay attention to it. There was a time that the Lord lived on this earth and he met the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and not Sadducees, they didn't get along. Pharisees out there, I believe it was. And they, I have got chalk dirt on me. I've got, I am just a mess. Don't pay no attention to that. Well, this is a give me suit. Somebody give me this. I've had this for five or six years. Yeah, it's made in China. You know it's good. Yeah, I know it's too short. It looks like I got high water pants on. I don't care. I got boots that cover my ankles. I'm good. I know it hasn't been pressed. It's all right. I don't care. Anyway, when I look at this and look at how the Lord deals with us, and deals with the things of God, uh, it's a sobering thing to see what God can teach here as he unfolds the word of God. And when God writes, as he, I told you, those Pharisees brought a woman that was taken, guess what, in adultery. 
<laughs> and the Lord, he wrote the word of God anyway. And he takes there on the ground and he writes something on the ground. And they all went away. I'm telling you, when he writes something down, we better pay attention. They paid attention. I don't know if he wrote their names down. <laughs> I don't know if he wrote the law down. <laughs> I don't know what he wrote down, but whatever he wrote down there, it got their attention and they all left. And when he looked up, he says, where art thou accusers? <laughs> he said, they've all gone. He said, go and sin no more. <laughs> and uh, there used to be a song, a quartet song about... Uh, See if you remember. Neither do I condemn thee, precious word divine, from the thought of mercy, like the sweetest vine. Da -da 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 Neither do I condemn thee. There it is. I'll go ahead and say, thank you, thank you. I need help from the congregation. But if God writes it, pay attention to us. He's writing on the wall over here. And he says, This is the writing that was written, many, many tekel eupharsism. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God had numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tickle, thou art weight in the balances and art found wanting. Piraz, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And that's exactly what was told to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he was the head of gold, so on and so forth. And the next one to come along would be the Medes and the Persian, which be silver. And that's what was going on here. And he says, uh, uh, then commanded Belshazzar and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Remember I said, he said third, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, if this guy is gone and Belshazzar's on the scene and Belshazzar's king, but making Daniel third, most historians believe that Belshazzar ruled with possibly another brother causing Daniel to be the third in the kingdom to rule. Now, do I, I just got that out of history, but people sometimes say, well, why would he be the third ruler? Why what wouldn't he be the second ruler? And that's probably the indication. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. Now, there's a whole lot said in history about this time and when... Uh, when the Babylonians were overrun by the Medo-Persian Empire. And God didn't record it all here in the Word of God. Uh, there's bits and pieces throughout, but God gave us enough here. We understood what happened. That's about all we actually need to know about it, unless you're a history lover and you want to dig in. Uh, but the, the doctrinal, or if you please, the historical writing is true and exact. Uh, the doctrinal ramification for that, that time and for the Jew God's judgment is true and will finally come to pass. And just like his reign was done, uh, the captivity of the Jews will be over one of these days because God's writing says it. Now, I put on here uh, the four or five things I learned in chapter 5, and I'll go through them. Am I seeing that right? Is the hand totally down? I didn't bring a watch today, or is it 10 till? Is that watch right? 9.30. Thank you. I can't, <laughs> I can't see it at all, but thanks for that good help out there. I'll go with the 20 till. I learned, number one, the deadly nature of the sin of pride. That speaks to everybody here. Belshazzar's problem was the nature of pride that he, he manifested. And pride is the evil response of sinful men to the grace of God. He knew about this because of his father. He knew about it because of Daniel, but he took heed to none of it. It is taking personal credit for what God has given or accomplished. Pride was the root sin necessitating uh, the disciplining of Nebuchadnezzar, as we learn both from Daniel chapter 4, and that's where that was, and our text in chapter 5, pride was also the sin of Belshazzar. It led to his uh, his blasphemous, if you please, acts of drinking out of the vessels and is ultimately his death and overthrow as a king. Pride got him there. Plenty of Bible verses all over the place. Pride is a dreaded and deadly sin. You can see how the principle of God speaks all through the ages. God's always been against pride. Uh, the devil was found with pride in him. It's what caused him to fall. Pride is an age-old 
uh, nature of man to have a little too much pride. So pride is seen more as a virtue. In our culture, it is not something men have too much of, but something men believe they lack and need more of. If you don't believe that, tune in the Reds or the NFL and listen to those guys talk about themselves. Well, I, you know, I got a 96 mile an hour fastball. I just don't see how, you know, I've, I mean, here, there's no humility in them at all. And it's scary sometimes. Why does the, you say, well, you got to have confidence. Yeah, well, <laughs> why does the Bible condemn men for thinking too highly of themselves and command them to do otherwise? Take your Bible and go to Philippians chapter 2. I'll watch that time carefully. Philippians chapter 2, the scripture says this in verse, well, it's the whole thing, but uh, uh, if, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any man comfort and love you, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, and he goes down through here, here the Christ, the believer's pattern, rejoicing in lowly services, or the exhortations to unity and meekness, uh, unity and meekness, which is total opposite of pride, and in Philippians chapter 2, 1 down through verse 11, that's what's going on there. The exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ and the sevenfold self-humbling of Christ. And he says, let this mind be in you. And in verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Preachers of the world's worst for wanting to have some kind of reputation. I, once you get around in that circle, they're as bad as anybody I know. And I, uh, I never fit in too well with those groups. You say, why? Well, number one, I always thought it was a lie. So, <laughs> and besides that, I had a pastor who lamb blasted it every chance he got and that's brother Jack Grigsby go on down there nothing but flesh anyway should you come back shot all full of holes <laughs> you know yeah, he's probably right you got to be careful so um, pride will get you in trouble every time like his father Belshazzar did not see God for who he was he didn't want to or who he is uh, he had no adequate grasp of the greatness of God, which always results in humility. If you really know who God is, you'll, it's easier to humble yourself before the Lord because you know it's just the grace of God. You draw your next breath. You take your next step. Uh, you even enjoy life. You even like uh, food. And, and, you know, it's just the grace of God. That's to a saved person. A lost person doesn't look at that at all. Uh, he almost has the entitlement uh, uh, Philosophy, you know, you owe this to me, you know, I've got, you know, that kind of thing. True worship sees God as high and lifted up, infinitely wise and all powerful. True worship causes men to fall before God in humble praise and adoration. That's true humility before the Lord. To fail to acknowledge the glory of God and purpose or promote one's own glory. Now, there's a lot of self promoting glory, is to pursue death. Uh, good thoughts here. We must not fail to learn this from the, the death of Belshazzar. So that's, that's one of the lessons I learned, the, the, the deadly nature of pride. Another lesson I learned just looking at the chapter and putting it together is the inadequacy of secular wisdom. Um, as I look at that, they called for all the guys to come in. Now, I like education as well as the next guy, but it's as nothing compared to the wisdom of God. And so uh, three times in the first five chapters of Daniel, the wise men in the land were summoned, remember that? By the king to tell him the truth which had been divinely revealed. Each time the wise men were focused on acknowledging their inability to do so. And I think that's pretty neat because it teaches us that worldly wisdom can't cut the mustard when it comes to the things of God. If you have a worldly skill, a worldly wisdom, if you're humble, it can help you through every situation. If you're not humble, but you're solely resting in that ability, then it's, it's a cause of death. And if you please, ignorance in spiritual things. So here, the wise men were forced to acknowledge their inabilities. Secular wisdom can never provide the answer for the all-important spiritual and eternal issues of life. The last place you want to go for the issues of life is to secular education. Uh, 
it just doesn't have the answers as proven time and time and time and time again. We can say good things about some of the teachers, good things about some of the classes and some of the courses, but the real wisdom comes from the spiritual things of this book. And that's why there has to be a good balance in our lives, if we're, we're Christians, of spiritual things and secular things. I've always appreciated those that were educated and those that uh, had a lot of knowledge, especially in a saved person, because with that come humility, and they're never tooting their own horn. Brother Jack used to say, yeah, he who toots his own horn doesn't realize he's on the little end. That's pretty good for you horn tooters, huh? And uh, there, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, the Lord says, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. And to me, that, that's always true, no matter how intellect you get. Uh, he says, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. And we can go on and on. Paul talking about the greatness of God for who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor or who has first given to him that it might be paid back again. Look, you can't get above the wisdom and knowledge of God. So I have learned in the study of just chapter five that worldly wisdom can't get the job done when it comes to godly spiritual things. And there's, we can go on a popular phrase today heard in Christian circles today says something like this, all truth is God's truth. Uh, I've heard that on the face of it. This is surely true and God does have all truth. But the problem is in placing secularly, if you please, secularly derived truth on the same level as divinely revealed truth. Does that make sense to you? I don't put secular truth on the same level as divine truth. Because whatever this side's saying always falls short of this side. And you see it throughout the Word of God, especially right here in the book of Daniel. So thirdly, the third thing I see, I'm watching very carefully. I've got all of about 30 seconds. Seeing the hand of God in history. And that's something we should always look for when we read the Word of God or listen to the Word of God or whatever it is. And uh, seeing the hand of God in history, and God does play a role in history. He's playing a role in our history today. He's played a role in history throughout the ages. And it's always better, it's easier to sit here and look back at history and see the hand of God than to look forward and understand the prophetical things that are going to happen that will make history one day. But I have learned seeing the hand of God in history, the spiritual divinely inspired account of the fall of Babylon differs uh, greatly from the secular account. And I'm not going to get into this, but the Bible gives you what you need to know about the fall. But when you start studying history, they go into the political ramifications of it, all the, all the other things, which really is boring. And there's nothing new about it on the earth. Uh, politicians were the same then as they are now. Amen. So same problem, and I wanted to give you those other things, two things, and we'll be done with chapter five. Fourthly, learning from history. One thing that people can't learn is that you can learn from history. <laughs> history repeats itself, so I've learned that. I'm impressed that while Belshazzar's punishment was revealed by the writing on the wall, uh, this king's sin was the result of his failure to heed the lessons which his father Nebuchadnezzar had learned. He would not learn from history. And the downfall of any nation is, is they won't learn from history. Uh, our nation should learn from history, but it doesn't. It keeps going on, getting better. It's got a progressive outlook now. It's doing this. It's doing that. Uh, but it's not embracing God more. It's embracing God less. So we need to learn from history. The fifth thing, and I had five things, I think. Five things. Yeah, I had five things. The last one is the judgment of God. I learned that in chapter 5, in Daniel chapter 5. It is the inspired account of the judgment of God falling upon the kingdom of Babylon, upon the king, the, its king, Belshazzar. And how sad to read of a king who parties while his kingdom crumbles and who fails to repent even when the day of judgment is divinely revealed to him, refusing to heed the handwriting on the wall. That's a picture of our society today. We kind of live in a great society, amen? I mean, we can eat, drink, and be merry like the Epicurean theory, eat, drink, and be merry. 
Uh, but you know what? We need to pay attention to God and the judgment of God as it is appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Seen all the way through this Bible. And for us to say today as leisure Americans, judgment isn't coming, judgment isn't coming, even for the child of God. We have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where all lost folks, dead, the dead that are lost, they're going to stand before the if you please, white throne judgment. Judgment is coming. So uh, I've learned that in chapter 5. So next week we'll talk about Daniel chapter 6. Who knows the central theme of Daniel chapter 6 without looking? The lion's den. So we'll talk about the lion's den, tell you how to get out of the doghouse. I mean the lion's den if you're in. So everything should be good. Did I say doghouse? I did. Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the scriptures that we can love and uh, cherish. Bless now our service as we begin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.